So today, Halloween 2020, Saturday the 31st of October, it is emerging, the news is breaking, or it's presently breaking still, but has largely broken, that Leo Varadkar, during his time as Taoiseach, that's Prime Minister of Ireland for anybody listening abroad, did something terrible. Now, if you've been watching Varadkar since he became Taoiseach, he's been doing something terrible from the start and continuously. He's been a terrible Taoiseach. And he's now a terrible Thornister and he's a terrible politician. So this story is breaking and Varadkar has responded as Varadkar does. He has said, you know, a number of the... He's gone through what was so eloquently described as the narcissistic prayer. I didn't do it or it's not as bad as you're making it out to be or somebody else made me do it or it's their fault. Those are kind of the four responses of narcissists he's a psychopath as well and there of course that goes hand in hand with psychopathology as well <laughs> frankly i am not interested in the ins and outs of what terrible thing varadkar did although it would appear that what he did was leak some kind of classified commercial information the nature of which might have swayed some kind of public decision in relation to the giving of a tender. He may or may not have done... I'm not sure of the ins and outs. Varadkar has responded immediately to the article in the Village magazine accusing them of defamation. But he has at the same time and in the same breath said that what they stated was factually correct. Then it's not defamatory. So how does he find it defamatory if what they've said is factually correct, that he did do this leak? So the claim of defamation, Ireland, by the way, doesn't have very strong defamation laws anymore. We used to, but we don't anymore. So the claim of defamation, even on the face of it, within the sentence, Faradgar has contradicted and undermined his own claim of defamation. You can only claim defamation if the claim made against you is untrue. So truth kills defamation claim immediately. It's the most ironclad defence to any defamation claim. Only somebody who's very stupid, though, would claim defamation about a remark that somebody made that's factually true but Varadkar is very stupid this is not relevant and it's probably what motivates me not to be particularly grabbed by the whys and wherefores of what he did and the ins and outs of what he did because he's been doing these kind of things he's been doing these kind of things from day one from before he was Taoiseach you know, we've all been calling him out on this for well over three years. Nobody's listened to us in the mainstream. And this now is leading into the next point. RTE, being RTE, had to break the story because it was breaking. It broke on the Village magazine. It had gone all over social media. People are talking about it left, right and centre. So what RTE did was they gave a, a news account of it which was quite simply Varadkar's version of events. The extent to which RTE, since Varadkar became Taoiseach in 2017, the extent to which RTE has gone to contortions and bent over backwards to manipulate the truth in favour of Varadkar has now become a positive art form. That was not my observation. It was made by somebody on social media a while ago. But the extent to which RTE, the contortions RTE goes to, to always make Faradkar look good, without exception, has indeed become an art form. So, when the story broke in Village magazine, I just said to everybody on social media, now watch to see how RTE will tell lies about this. They will either tell lies or they will omit essential points of fact or they'll do some of the, you know, they they will they will run to the rescue of Varadkar and sure enough they have. Sure enough they have. John Williams, who's the head of news in RTE, recently spent a very large sum of money, probably up to a million euros, on both internet advertisements and ads, expensive ads in Sunday newspapers. I think, uh, if, off the top of my head, trust matters or the truth matters or some slogan that he probably paid a consultant 750000 to make up. John Williams is not a journalist. John Williams is a government courtier. 
based upon i mean this emerged last year when i saw and i've mentioned this before how rte told lies in relation to varadkar smearing four whistleblowing doctors in waterford so this does not surprise me i would be more surprised if rte was truthful or balanced in reporting what varadkar has done and what he has said this time one more gaffe one more crass infantile inane gaff by Varadkar. People are forgetting something that Varadkar did. This one was conveniently memory hold by Williams and by the Irish Times. In 2017, after Varadkar became Taoiseach, he embarrassed himself in Downing Street. But then he went and embarrassed himself in the White House. But the, what happened in the White House was exponentially more serious because he was showing off and he lost the run of himself and he gave an extremely undignified and improper and indecorous speech in, in his capacity as the head of the Irish government in the White House, which is the official residence of the head of state of the United States. He used bad language, but in, he, he also took on that particular manner that he has when he thinks he's being hilarious. He's one of the most unhilarious human beings, uh, uh, that's said charitably, around. There's no, there's no crime in not being a funny person. There are many people out there who are naturally lacking spontaneity and who are naturally lacking a, sense, a strong sense of humour. That's okay. Nobody minds that. But be yourself. Just be serious. If you're not going to be able to be witty, the way you know, Trump has a natural spontaneity and wit, of course, the mainstream media plays that down and it's a sign of Trump's intelligence his emotional intelligence and his ability to relate no 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 but if you're not that type of person it's okay Theresa May was not that type of person but you didn't try to be funny Theresa May had many setbacks in her capacity as British Prime Minister she was quite indecisive and weak she was she didn't have a winning manner but she didn't she wasn't an embarrassing individual but Faradkar made this speech in the White House and one of the things that he admitted to was that in his capacity as a member of cabinet he had interfered in a planning process regarding, if I recall correctly, wind farms. At that point, that's when the DPP should have been knocking on Faradkar's door. Faradkar admitted in one of his looser moments, Faradkar admitted to having interfered in a planning process. In other words, Faradkar admitted to having been corrupt. That was three years ago that Faradkar said this in the White House. He admitted to being corrupt. He admitted to interfering in a planning process. I never forgot that. And I've mentioned that in court. I've mentioned that in court documents. I've mentioned that many, many times. So the notion that Faradkar was, is corrupt or that he interferes in uh, legally constrained and established decision-making processes, that's no surprise. He's said it before. He's admitted it before. But back in 2017, he was the new Taoiseach and RTE was absolutely pulling out all the stops to promote him 24th. They still are, of course. Nothing has changed because John Williams is in charge of news and current affairs in RTE. And Williams doesn't even pretend to be even-handed. And he doesn't even pretend to be objective. So he spent, he wastes money on these ridiculous ads about tr truth matters or trust matters, whatever name they've come up with. But he does not behave in a truthful or trustworthy way. That's the problem. No spin you, you know, Prefab Sprout, that wonderful English rock group from the 80s, one of the best English rock groups of all, had one particular line, all the gold bullion in the world cannot replace that which is simply second rate. This is the same with John Williams. He's a second rate individual and a second rate news editor. And Varadkar is a second rate politician, a second rate person, and a second rate Taoiseach and a second rate Thornishta. Absolutely. You, you know, you can't make a silk purse out of a sow's ear, either with John Williams or with Leo Varadkar. That's the way it is. So Varadkar has wasted tens of millions on a spin unit no of course nobody condemns him for that that and the question is this why is so much effort put in by rte at the most senior level to promote Faradkar and to minimize his wrongdoing and his corruption and his criminality Faradkar, if this latest thing that's come out is in any way true 
alongside what I mentioned in 2017, the man is a repeat criminal. And I will stand over that, and I hope he hears me say that. I, Christian Morris, accuse Leo Varadkar in his capacity as a Taoiseach and politician of being a repeat offender. I would love to be sued for that because I would defend that. I would defend that in full. The man is a criminal based upon his own descriptions and what's now emerging. Yet RTE did not even attempt to cite the article in the Village magazine which broke the story. And okay, people are now speculating about who leaked it to Village magazine. That, I suppose, is of interest. It could be of interest. But the facts either stand or they don't. So it's an important feature of criminal law or civil law that you assess the facts on their own merits rather than who gave them or other ancillary things around them. So we have these two instances from 2017 and now of Aradkar being a criminal. Yet RTE is now has moved immediately to minimise this by excluding the other side of the argument being given by the Village magazine. Furthermore, now we're looking at how the politicians are now close, circling their wagons around Varadkar. Oh, he has to come into the Doyle and he has to give an adequate explanation. No, he doesn't, because he will just go in and do what Varadkar does in the Doyle and waffle and obfuscate and blame and point the finger of blame at others the way he did with the Waterford whistleblowers. It reminds me of Dancing at Lunasa, by the wonderful play by Brian Friel, which was actually derived, largely inspired by a short story of his, his, A Man's World and an Only Child, in which he was describing loosely his childhood in Glentis in County Donegal. He would go and visit a family of unmarried aunts who lived in quite a remote part of Highland Donegal. And the aunts had one sister called Rose, who was mentally subnormal. And the way that they would, in that very nice Donegal, gentle way, describe Rose is they would say, Rose will always be Rose. And that was nice. And Varadkar will always be Varadkar. The notion of getting Varadkar into the Doyle and getting some kind of waffly explanation out of him, that's... It's, it, it's, it's of nugatory importance. And again, for the politicians to be saying... You know, Mr. Varadkar, the Thornister, has to come in and explain this to the Doyle. What they're doing is they're abusing his Doyle privilege because anything that's said in the Doyle is privileged. It cannot be used in a criminal prosecution. So what they're doing is they're working with Varadkar and RTE to minimise this and to circle the wagons around Varadkar. It doesn't matter what Varadkar says in the Doyle. Rose will always be Rose and Varadkar will always be Varadkar. It doesn't matter what he says in the Doyle. What matters is whether or not the DPP is preparing a file to investigate Varadkar with the possibility of him being prosecuted either summarily or on, or on indictment for corruption. That's the only thing that matters. And again, it gets back to the thing with the 81 golfers this year. Are those 81 golfers being prosecuted? I don't want to hear about apologies. I don't want to hear about James Wolfe giving long-winded stories to the Chief Justice. That doesn't matter. What matters is whether or not those 81 golfers are being prosecuted for what they did. Because they broke the law. And by the description in the Village magazine, Faradkar broke the law. And by what he rambled on about in the White House, he broke the law. That's what matters. Is RTE knocking on Varadkar's door or going to the Doyle and asking the other politicians, hang on, Mr Varadkar, the present Thornish, the former Taoiseach, has admitted to behaving corruptly, has admitted to interfering in an official selection process. He has admitted to this. So what is your opinion on him now facing criminal prosecution? Has a file been sent to the DPP? Has anybody gone to the DPP about this? Because a file doesn't just land on the DPP's desk. You have to make a complaint to the Gardaí. Any criminal matter is investigated in the first instance by the Gardaí. You go in, you make a complaint, you make a statement, you hand in the evidence. The guards then decide what to do with it. Usually, if it's a more serious indictable offence, they automatically just hand the whole file over to the DPP. The DPP then decides whether or not a prosecution should happen. So has a file been sent to the DPP? 
or somebody in the process of beginning to send a file to the DPP regarding Varadkar, both in 2017 and now. Because if they're not, nothing else matters. And the question arises then, the further question arises of why do they do this? Why does RTE continually, continually massage the truth by omission and by euphemism and by gliding around the facts to do this? Why are they so committed? Again, as somebody described, I'm repeating what somebody said, it is an art form at this stage. It's far, far beyond negligence or laziness. It is an art form. I'll digress slightly. For Varadkar to say that he did not know that what he was doing was corrupt or was a criminal offence is no defence. Because, as they say, ignorance is no defence in the eyes of the law. So the fact that you were ignorant of something being a crime absolutely is no defence. It won't be considered. But to get back on track... Why do RTE do this? This has been going on now for over three years, repeatedly, without any remit, without any remission, sorry. This has been going on with no break. Continuous promotion of Varadkar, continuous minimisation of all of his, his continuous inane gaffes. Another personal bet noir of mine was the letter to Kylie Minogue. And again, what happened was... You know, RTE in the mainstream media. Oh, ho, ho, isn't Leo Gas? Thomas Sheridan says that you should never address politicians or refer to them by their first name, and he's right. I did that before. I was, well, I had that opinion that Thomas had before, but it was Thomas who crystallised it in my own head. Isn't Leo Gas? He wrote a letter to Kylie. Well, no, actually, because that letter was addressed on government notepaper. So it wasn't. I mean, it would have been cringy enough if he had written it from his home address, but there wouldn't have been anything untoward about it. But for the Taoiseach, for the acting Taoiseach, to write to Kylie Minogue on government notepaper is an abuse of his office. And that is serious. That is serious. But again, oh, Leo's a... <laughs> Leo's a gas. <laughs> Leo's a gas. <laughs> I was like, ah, man, ah. So what would you do with him? <laughs> what would you do with him? I don't know. Send a file to the DPP and maybe not vote for him. Maybe not vote for him. So we get back 35 Fine Gael TDs in February. Well, I said it. I've said it many, many times before. That was when I said, the Irish people now do not need my amazing talents. I can just go and walk off the rainbow here in relation to all of this. I will look after myself. I will look after my nearest and dearest. I will look after my tribe. Nobody else matters. They voted Fine Gael back in. They let 35 Fine Gael TDs back in. And God knows how many, I think, how many green TDs in. And now they're paying the price. I hope all of those people who supported Fine Gael and who supported the Greens are loving every moment of this. The cycle lanes being put up on the quays in Dublin. Um, the railway lines not being reopened. More taxes, more taxes, more taxes. Taxes on the elderly, taxes on heating, taxes on clothes, taxes on food. That's what happens when you let these people back in. You had your chance back in February, you blew it. That's quite aside from the lockdown and how much damage the lockdown has caused to this country. But of course, and Martin Feely, the, doc- the whistleblowing doctor, who dared to question COVID-19 and who was forced out of his job. He described how all of these experts, Varadkar just being one of many, they speak ex cathedra. What he's referring to is the way that RTE and the Irish Times never, never, never question these people on any of the facts that they, or not even the facts, but any of these claims that they make. They give these press conferences with Mark, Tony Holohan primarily gives these press conferences. It's repeated in RTE and nobody uses that up, that broadcast moment to question, even just to question what has been said. This is the central thing. The enemy in Ireland today is a totally, totally lickspittle mainstream media, primarily RTE, ably assisted by the Irish Times. There are many others, News Talk and Virgin Media and all the rest of them. You know, they're all part of it. But the primary culprits are RTE, first and foremost, and very close second to the Irish Times. That's the enemy. That's who we need to focus on. And... 
for me, when the election came through in February this year, initially I was very depressed because the notion of Simon Harris being back in, Owen Murphy, Veratka, all of those ones, dreadful, dreadful, fifth-rate, psychopathic, childish imbeciles being back in. It was depressing in the first instance, but I said, no, 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 no. Very quickly, I reorganised my thoughts. I said, my job here is to take on the mainstream media, not to worry about the politicians. Forget about that. Write that off. The only reason why they got re-elected at all, and you know they got re-elected, I think Simon Harris was re-elected on the 15th count, Murphy was re-elected on something like the 13th count, but of course RTE and the Irish Times began banging the drums about what a huge electoral success for Radcliffe had pulled off. Of course, that's RTE. The job of journalists is to be objective, the job of journalists is to be balanced, the job of journalists is to consider every side of the argument. And moreover, the job of journalists is to ask the awkward, use their journalistic privilege to ask the awkward questions that people who are on the outside, like myself, are not empowered to ask. Yet, now once again we see Veradkar has admitted to com committing a crime. And once again, RTE have rowed in behind him. And there's probably an innocent explanation to it more than anything else. John Williams is woke. RTE is woke. Varadkar is woke because he's Ireland's first gay Taoiseach and he's of Indian descent. There is a, to suggest that there's a conspiracy going on here is to suggest that they're competent and clever enough to do a conspiracy. They're not. Certainly Varadkar isn't. Certainly not. It's more innocently explained, I suspect, by what could be described as woke groupthink. Woke groupthink. Varadkar is gay and half Indian and also he f ticks another Wirra Wirra Fina Foil box. He's a doctor. Oh well, he went to college and he's a doctor. Wow, wow, wow. Thomas Sheridan talks about a particular type of snivelling, cowardly, mediocre Irish middle class man. Yes, Thomas is right, but there's a term you use for it, the Wirra Wirra character. Oh, Wirra Wirra. Wirra Wirra. Oh, Wirra Wirra. Isn't it terrible? Oh, Wirra Wirra. Thomas is right. But it's those Wirra Wirra ones who have backed up the lockdown while at the same time having all of their prospects stolen from them like their pensions and their homes and the prospects of their adult children. Because if we look at the economy for a moment, which RTE of course doesn't, of course doesn't talk about. Oh, of course they don't talk about the suicides, they don't talk about the businesses closing, they don't talk about the violence, they don't talk about the mental illness. No, 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 no. But those wera wera ones you may they have may have their mortgage paid off they may be in their 60s or their early 70s now but oh what about those adult children in their 40s who've got big mortgages to pay what's going to happen there hmm? and they have grandchildren sophie and jack sophie and jack the grandchildren what they're going to do there huh what's going to happen there because when those mortgages go up the spout and Dermot and Karen and the children, Sophie and Jack, and the Labradoodle, do not forget the Labradoodle, when they are all destitute, they will be knocking on mum and dad's door. Ray and Mora. Ray and, Ray and Mora. They'll be knocking on Ray and Mora's door in Terenure or Temple Oak or wherever it is. So, the, you know, the woods are burning. The woods are burning. It doesn't apply to an elderly couple like my parents because I live with them anyway and I have no debt. Okay, I'm on the dole. But that's not the issue. The issue that's going that's going to be coming around to bite people isn't whether or not you have a huge amount of cash flow at the moment because actually the market is deflating. Again, RTE and the Irish Times won't tell you about that. But the deflation in the market is incredible at the moment. There's never been a time like this. We're going back to 1970s prices. So the cash in your pocket will actually be able to buy a lot more than previously. But that's not the point. That's not the point. The point is that it's debt that's going to kill people because negative equity is going to crucify. In a deflationary market, negative equity is terrible. Is RTE talking about that? Of course not. Of course not. And watch how they lie about Veradkar this time again, the way they've been doing for three and a half years. Psst.